here again. Uh, so welcome all the panelists. I would uh, like to have one round of just introduction. Uh, and rather than me introducing all of you, it's better that you introduce yourself. And then we will go um, uh, around of uh, conversation. Uh, the way I would like to uh, suggest that we do it is that uh, maybe we can tackle three, four issues, uh, which I can ask in terms of questions. And then each one of you can have two, three minutes on each one of them. And then uh, followed by uh, a round of question and answer from the uh, audience so that it can be interactive. So that's what more or less uh, this, uh, this uh, session is about. So from you. Hi, everybody. Very happy to be here. My name is Fatma. I work at Google, and I do public policy there. And my work is essentially looking at the way technology interacts with society and how it impacts both of those things, so how, how technology is impacted by society and how society is impacted by technology. And I'll also put in a disclaimer, well, actually two disclaimers. Uh, my views here are my own and not representative of the companies necessarily. And my second disclaimer is that I cannot by any stretch of imagination claim to be an expert in social media. Uh, as my friend pointed out last evening, I have a total of uh, two followers on Twitter. So. <laughs> Uh, my name is Peter Vroman. I'm the spokesperson and information officer here at the U.S. Embassy. Um, and under our portfolio, you'll meet some of my colleagues, uh, in particular our social media uh, coordinator, Megan McGill, tomorrow, who will be engaged in some of the social media activities. Um, we maintain several social media properties at the Embassy, and so they fall under uh, my domain, including the Twitter feeds, um, Google Hangouts, um, Facebook chats and Facebook pages. Um, as, well as, uh, as well as the all-important web pages, which we're beginning to try to make into um, multilingual versions of our web pages. So my, I'm a practitioner in the sense of trying to see how embassies and bureaucracies uh, can engage with, uh, with citizens in the countries where we serve, and uh, in the course of the discussion, I'll, I'll lay that out. Um, I, I do have a Twitter feed, but not many more followers than you, but we have an institutional Twitter feed that uh, is, is quite large, as well as a Facebook page. Hello, everyone. I'm Roma Sharma. I'm the Delhi Digital Editor at the BBC. Um, if you haven't been able to guess from my accent, I am from London. Um, but I have been here for the last year or so working in our bureau. Um, so I've come to Delhi to make, basically make our newsroom even more digital, even more social. Um, I used to provide a lot of digital consultancy within the BBC um, back in London, so I've kind of been here to transform our newsroom into a more digital savvy place. Um, so part of that was setting up a social media desk and we have quite a, quite a dynamic BBC Hindi Facebook page actually, which we're very proud of. And, we, you know, I'd like to share some of those insights with you. We also have a BBC India Twitter feed, which is an English feed. And we've been running um, uh, a very exciting project called Digital Indians at the moment. So if you are interested in Digital India, which I guess being at this summit, you probably are, um, you might want to check out the hashtag BBCDI um, for some more information or even our website, which is bbc.com forward slash Digital Indians. Um, I'll stop being such a shameless plug. Um, but, uh, but, you know, going back to what you were saying about being an expert, I guess I've been around in this space for a couple of years now, but I always have the same disclaimer, actually, because this space changes so frequently. And if I was to say that the social media sphere in London is the same as the US, is the same as India, I'd be completely ignorant. Um, so, you know, happy to share insights, but also very happy to be challenged by you. So, you know, I'm sure there are lots of experts in this crowd, and I would also love to hear what your experiences have been as, as we're trying to kind of understand the Indian online space. Um, that's me. Hi, I'm Prashanto Roy. Uh, I've uh, been with Cyber Media Publications, which is a publisher of technology magazines like DataQuest and PCQuest, and there were some 15 of them. For a little over two decades, I was, until recently, I was um, heading that group as uh, president chief editor. Uh, today, I'm an independent consultant. I consult to cyber media. Uh, I write, and I'm an analyst and writer on technology, social media, and green, green tech, 
uh, I'm building the first uh, home in the country, individual home, to be green certified by Terry. So that's, that's an interest, but I'm doing a lot of evangelization and speaking on green. Uh, social media is, uh, is, of course, a very high and strong interest. It's something I've been writing, covering, uh, speaking about. And in fact, I am right now also consulting to the BBC, so uh, in the same Digital Indians project, which is rather interesting because it's kind of cross-platform, but it's led by social media and online. Uh, and followed by the other components and you know television and so on so that's that's really an interesting project so I, I really hope to get into some of the details of the very exciting stuff which is happening on social media here because you know it's all gone well beyond the traditional social media and it it's it's amazing to speak of things like Facebook and Twitter as traditional but the fact is now there's the highest growth is in areas like there's Pinterest and Tumblr there's WhatsApp, which is being considered a social platform because there are zillions of young people on WhatsApp. Uh, there's things like SlideShare, which are totally different. You know, they're places where things are shared, media is shared, and then people come and comment on them. So those are not things that would have usually been thought of as social media, but it's completely changing the landscape. And it's kind of a huge equalizer for, uh, you know, not just uh, everyday, not just citizens, but you know, NGOs, organizations, which simply would not have had the reach of uh, a, kind of a large corporate player. So exciting discussion, looking forward to it, Shubranj. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Very, very happy to be here. My name is uh, Shubranshu Chaudhary, and uh, I work to make social media social. Now, you would say, what is that? <laughs> Uh, I'm so glad that all of you are from South Asia, so you'll understand. Social media is social in America, in Finland, but if you talk about South Asia, it's pretty anti-social. Now, I wish uh, <laughs> Osama started with that. I wish the secretary was here. He was giving all these impressive figures, but um, that's what we need to do here. We need to make social media social. If I talk to only 10% you know, of people, I shouldn't be you know, called very social in this country, um, in this gathering. We have community radio. There is no community in that. And um, social media needs to be made social by some tools. Mobile is one. Radio is another one which we very conveniently forget. So I hope we will talk more about it. So what I do is I, I work with an organization called CG Netswara, which is an experiment to link internet, mobile phone, and radio, which we are completely unsuccessful at the moment due to legal restrictions. And I would like to talk more about it. Thanks. Great. So uh, you can already feel the pulse where uh, the things are going to happen by the end of 1130. Uh, for me, uh, you know, uh, social media started with lots of hype. It created a lot of enablement. It has, it has created a lot of buzz. In fact, after internet, it is the social media which is the biggest buzz. Now internet is more like given, you know, and social media is something which is now taken in the place of uh, adopting. I would say the three things that I would like uh, all of you to highlight is that what exactly is social media and it is really worth the time and energy that it is taking in our life or you know or it is just helping the industry because most of the providers of a platform of social media are industry you know it is not like the government is providing or it is it is also not profitable most of them even if it is industry then where where is it going is it citizen oriented they can uh, you know, take the plug out and it's gone. It's, you know, what, what is it? Is it a media or it is just a citizen or it's citizen media or it's just a social media but it is in the hands of the industry? What, it is, a, uh, what is it that you think? Uh, you know, this is, this is my broad question to all of you and you can take your, you know, two, three minutes of time to explain and, and give your opinion one by one and I would start again from Fatima. Sure. Um, well, I think to answer your question, the power in politics, both of a medium, comes from the people that use it, right? So you can use Facebook to post pictures of the parties that you went to last night, or you can use it for something else. Um, it's working. Okay. Um, so there are, there are lots of innovations that are happening in this space, starting from the way knowledge is produced or uh, discovered or shared widely, in terms of, uh, you know, so when, when things started and 
search engines were mostly used for uh, information discovery and for sharing knowledge and creating knowledge. It's now moved to a more social level where people, communities are together collaborating to create knowledge uh, on platforms such as Wikipedia. Uh, Swara is a very good example of that, of how it's being used by the community. And in that, I think, uh, I think the failing often is that we put too much emphasis on the technology itself. So there's a trend of technology solutionism, that technology is going to solve all of the world's problems, which is not the case. Because unless technology, technology always comes with an embedded context, a social political context. Uh, it is disruptive, yes, social media, but is it always disruptive for the good? And that's the question that we need to ask. So you can have, you can have a medium like uh, CG Netswara or Gram Vani, which actually you know, incorporates the Indian context when it's building those technologies, which allows people to share what they want, people who wouldn't naturally have the voice uh, to enter into mainstream media. So, so it's really over, it's, it's about overcoming the, the social political constraints as well, while you're all, also providing the resource. So I think I would start with that and then. Okay, great. Peter. Well, I thought I was a moderator, not a participant, but I'll, I'll still, uh, <laughs> I'll keep it short. Um, well, I think that <coughs> Michael, um, my boss, is mentioned that it's a network um, as well as a technology or a tool. And what I think that for an embassy uh, on Shanti Path, very beautiful, very green, quite remote from people, from the social element um, that you mentioned. And so in some ways, I think it's a, it's a really an opportunity for outreach um, to demystify what is an embassy, or perhaps other institutions, or companies, or governments, or citizen movements, helping to share ideas. I really like the comment about uh, SlideShare. You know, a PowerPoint that you put up on the back, you can actually share that, and that brings, it's also a means of education. Um, many, and we, we're dealing with this in the US, I think, as well as in India, the IITs and others, that it's a way to share lectures by video, by voice, by radio, uh, by podcast. So it's a way to share information. Um, it's a way to potentially educate. It depends whether it's, a, but education is not always passive. So how does it become an active tool? Um, and for, for us, again, coming back to my role at the embassy as an information officer, how do you get it in two directions? Is it just the metrics that you get off of Google or Facebook that matter? Or is it the content of the ideas? And I think that when it becomes, when it becomes real, uh, and it becomes personalized to a degree that you can have an interaction, uh, that is what makes it powerful in that when you're able to have a communication with somebody who may be in a distant part of India, uh, with somebody on Shantipath, they feel that they're able to have access to a place that may be perceived as a place of power and be able to share their ideas. And in turn, for those of us inside an embassy, for us to realize that there's a greater audience and while we can't claim that we, in, through our social media outreach, um, are scientifically surveying all of what India or South Asia thinks about our policies or about our activities, we can at least have a reality check, um, apart from the traditional media, uh, from citizens in the country and what they think about various issues which we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So that is for us, that reality check and that interchange an exchange of both information and ideas is what is both powerful and new, I think, in social media. Um, I think that reality check word is, is actually quite poignant um, because how many times have journalists sort of, you know, been broadcasting for themselves? You know, they think of, they might think of a news story and think of a particular angle. And there's been a number of times in the newsroom where I've said, well, why don't we ask the audience and see what they think of that particular story? That doesn't necessarily mean we ditch our editorial judgment or we ditch you know, the information that we have, but it means that actually we can make assumptions sometimes and let's use social media to understand our audiences better. And I think for me, the single most powerful thing about social media, or at least one of them, is diversity. That diversity of voice and reach. Um, in my uh, early, when I first started in social and digital, I had to do 
a lot of convincing of a lot of cynical journalists and very seasoned managers and convince them that it really was worth taking the time to engage on social media. Yes, there's a lot of noise. Yes, we need some sort of uh, effective noise cancelling devices. Um, but the beauty of it is, is that you can reach and talk to people you would access um, or find. Um, coming back to our Facebook page, you know, we regularly hear people hear from people in the villages, in small towns, so far from Delhi where we're sitting in our offices, um, which I really believe makes our journalism richer and more uh, in sync with what you know with what's actually happening. So, reality check, absolutely. Um, richer journalism as far as I'm concerned um, and also the second part of the thing I think as an industry we're doing now is thinking about what engagement looks like what does meaningful engagement look like how do we invest the time and the resources to be able to create meaningful dialogue with our audiences so that it's meaningful for them but also for us journalists it means better journalism and that's what we're thinking about right now so you know starting with this question of what is social media I mean, clearly today, uh, it seems to be any platform which uh, encourages sharing of information from a large group of people. And when you use that fairly inclusive <coughs> definition, you know, you begin to bring in all these other things like WhatsApp, etc., which were simply not considered social media. But today, when you actually look at issues like safety of kids on social media and so on, you're finding that uh, there's actually a move away from these so-called traditional platforms for the kids. And they're moving toward things like WhatsApp or Pinterest, in Instagram, and so on, which were simply initially just like photo sharing sites. WhatsApp is, of course, just a messenger platform. But uh, you know, you have groups on WhatsApp, fairly large groups on WhatsApp. Many times, you know, there are strangers on those groups. You don't really know them. Uh, there was a case of a 12-year-old who committed suicide in the U.S., and you know, a lot of that haranguing that happened with her actually happened on WhatsApp. So uh, the, the 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 point is, uh, you know, without getting into that detail. Uh, the point is there's, a, there's an explosion of types of social media platforms. That's one. Uh, number two, I think what's of great interest to us is mobile. And uh, what's happening in India is if you look at the numbers, uh, there's about 75 million people who are officially on the internet, full-fledged internet connectivity, including smartphone access. But there's uh, 145 million is the total number of people with some sort of connectivity uh, to a platform using data. And that difference of 145 million and 75 million is actually all low-end mobile phones. Most of them are using a little thing called, you know, Facebook Messenger, a lighter version of, uh, so, you know, Facebook, uh, basically Facebook for low-end phones. And uh, they use very, very small data packs. Uh, they don't, uh, you know, they're obviously all prepaid connections. They might go out and buy a data pack for one, uh, one rupee or five rupees or ten rupees. And that's a major now direction for uh, telecom operators to go and see how they can actually leverage and make money. Now, this is really interesting because for many of these people, uh, many of these people who are kind of what uh, would be described as bottom of the pyramid in economics, uh, you know, this uh, engagement with social media, like it has happened with communications itself, has gone a little higher on the Maslow's hierarchy than food. Uh, you know, there's actually street kids who make 70, 80 rupees a day, and uh, you know they spend maybe 10 rupees on food and another 20 rupees or 30 rupees on things like access, uh, social media access, uh, Facebook access, or data access, or porn. So I mean, there's a inversion of Maslow's out there, which is kind of interesting. Um, I think a lot of uh, people, a lot of people have been really grappling with this. Uh, you know, I mean, what is social media from the media from the mainstream, traditional mainstream media point of view, you know, we would describe it in a uh, very, uh, you know, navel-gazing kind of way as user-generated content. Now, of course, the social media user doesn't get that. I mean, he, he doesn't, uh, when he tweets something, he doesn't call it content. Uh, we do. Uh, so for us, uh, it's a way of creating content without having to pay uh, journalists. Uh, but uh, media is really grappling with this because, you know, journalists, a lot of journalists are on Twitter, uh, Facebook, Google+, and they're trying to use it in their work. They're trying to grapple with the fact that there are so many people out there on Twitter who have much greater reach than they individually do, or even more than their collective publication or television house or whatever does. And uh, that's, that's a new reality. Uh, 
corporates have been really struggling with social media for a very long time. Uh, a very few of them have got it, and they've been at it for a long time in India. You know, there are names like Clear Trip, and uh, you know, uh, there, there are quite a few who've been doing great things, and you know, actually looking at generating a conversation uh, with their customers, with potential customers, etc., and trying to anticipate and solve problems. There are other bigger companies like Airtel which have been exploring the waters and are kind of halfway there in terms of. There are many others who are who uh, are just struggling with social media and find themselves at the receiving end because you have this suddenly empowered person out there who has has a problem with a product or a service or a hotel or an airline and he's going to tweet it out and uh, it's very easy to reach uh, you know and if you try to suppress that you have something called the Streisand effect which says the more you try to suppress it the more it's going to explode and we've seen that happen in India where somebody's tweeted something about a politician and that politician has filed a Section 66A Information Technology Act case against him. Uh, the police have registered that case. And uh, that person who had 1616 followers, you know, in 24 hours it became 3,000 followers on Twitter. And, uh, you know, another 24 hours it reached about 3 million people through television and so on. So, very, very interesting phenomena there which uh, media, government, regulators, they're simply not able to get. And maybe another thing we are going to probably touch on is regulation, which is something that all of government, all governments are trying to grapple with. There's a lot of work here which has happened on that. There's things like the infamous Section 66A Act. There's also a lot of use by social, uh, of social media by, uh, uh, you know, government, people in government, uh, especially the younger crop of politicians who are actually using it fairly effectively. There are very famous names like Shashi Tharoor who personally do a lot of tweeting and they have a million plus, for, you know, several million followers. Uh, so, a very, very uh, brave new world out there and a lot of people are simply just testing the waters. But it's really, you know, just to get back to what I started with, a great leveler in terms of uh, uh, the whole democratic process and potentially of getting every last person out there a voice to reach out to government, corporates, policy makers, whatever. I think the challenge is to make it happen so that it's, it's really that much of a leveler. And I think that's what Shubranshu is really working on. Thanks, Prashantu. Now you can see all the three mics have reached here in this table. So for the next half an hour, you're going to listen to only three of us, and that's called social media. That's the politics, and I'm very serious. This is what I want to talk about. Um, recently, I was telling somebody that I divide India into three parts. Now you will say I'm a Maoist. <coughs> First class is called internet class, who lives in their own world, and if I co can quote Arundhati Roy, uh, they live physically here, but you know they, are, they have their own world, and they actually live in America. The second, and that number was, uh, you know, <laughs> or or in Britain or in Netherlands. <laughs> And yes, that number is much bigger than Britain and India. So you can live in this world and can think that's the whole world. And uh, that number is huge, 10% of India or 15% of India. And the second world is, or second class is mobile class. You know? And that number is good, 40%, 50% of India. And they're aspiring to join the internet world. They have a voice, they have a machine at the moment, which is called a mobile phone. And the third class, which I call the radio class, which does not have any voice, who can only listen to people like Rama or me, who was part of BBC before, who tell them what is good for them, and you know, they should be doing what? <laughs> so social media, I understand by the word social came not from India. I mean, in social media in Finland, as I said, or in England or in Britain, is democratic. It is democratizing communication. It's making dialogue possible. So far, what we have in India or all over the world, the mainstream media which we call, I call it Asaram Bapu model. Now, <laughs> now don't take me otherwise. He does many other things, but what I'm talking about is pravachan, means, you know, top down, you know, very small number of people deciding what is good or what is news. The same was the case when we were not democracy. 
all over the world, okay, I'm not talking about Syria and Libya, but at least in South Asia, we have democratized our politics. You know, I know the friend from Bhutan is here, there's some, that's the newest experiment with democracy going on. The social media is experiment of democratization of communication. If we don't have a democratic communication, our political democracy cannot function well. And that's what is happening. So what I was talking, what I mean by social media is we will have to make it Indian, we will have to make it South Asian, we will have to make it really social here. In Finland, everybody has internet, so the communication has flattened. It's a, it's a, it's a dialogue model. As we started the morning that India is the oldest form of democracy. So, when, so what I was talking about this mic, that's what has happened to us when we developed. When we were a small community, when we had our panchayat, when we discussed in our, uh, you know, under the banyan tree, the media was not owned by anyone. Air was owned by everyone. So we had a communication problem, like a communication uh, system which solved problems. But what happened is what has happened here. All the machines came to one side. This was an accident here. Maybe that was the politics there. And whoever has the machine can communicate. So unlike the air in that panchayat, which nature has given, everybody had equal access to hear, to be heard. But with ownership of machine, that changed. And that is mainstream media. That has become very top-down, where five people who are employee of some people who own lots of money, we are deciding what is news, what is not news. And that's what is getting challenged in social media when we are now, we are distributing the machine. So thank you very much, Osama. <laughs> that's what I wanted to say. That that's what we need to do that machines needs to be distributed, or we need to work with machines which people have. Uh, say like, like writing. Writing is an evolved form of communication. Majority of uh, Indians or South Asians, we can communicate orally. But I was listening very carefully to the secretary. He started with, we had print media, and now we have 800 television. He very conveniently you know, ignored radio. Majority, a huge majority of this country still is dependent on radio. And if we link radio with internet and mobile phone and some more technologies, as we are trying to experiment in CG Netswara, you can actually create a democratic communication platform. You can actually create a social media in India. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, just to give you a, before we go into, uh, you know, into the second part of the discussion, and Aditya, I think, just got in, um, uh, you missed the wisdom of the <laughs> morning, <laughs> I guess. Um, what, what he was saying is basically, we are the largest on Facebook. Do you know that? Uh, second largest country on the Facebook. Big number. But that is less than 7% of the country. That is what I think what he is trying to tell that uh, India may be the second largest on Facebook with 65 million population, second largest after US, I guess, but we are just 7%. India may be the third largest country on internet with 100, uh, you know, 100, 120, 130 million people, but we are 10 to 12% in our own country. And that is important for all of us to think about what kind of media make people inclusive into discussion or dialogue and all that. And being an oral society, it is the oral media that makes it more inclusive. And we need to perhaps uh, think of all the time that which is the medium in the hand which makes more inclusive people and in the dialogue. And that's very important. That is where I think mobile and radio are going to make a huge, huge uh, impact, even on social media in the next 
few years as it broadens the, uh, the masses to be uh, inclusive. I will now hand over my to uh, Peter uh, to take the next uh, session, which is more uh, you know, from the point of view of people's participation. And I would also request you to uh, include Aditya uh, Great. So I'm going to play the, the role of Donahue. We'll leave one of the devices here, but we're going to democratize and, uh, and, and really open up uh, the questions to, um, to the audience to find out what are your questions of this disting distinguished panel um, about social media. We had a number of topics amongst ourselves about trends, about access. I think you've heard uh, in our introductory remarks a lot. So why don't I turn it down and, and bring the, the, the microphone to the questions. Sir. Come on up. Yeah, I am Tarun. Uh, my question is about uh, uh, what I understand about stand up, stand up. Yeah, so social media in India. Still, we seem to be more consuming more content than creating content. If we take the example of Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn, most of the time we see that you know people forward the message which has been written by maybe somebody or so which would be a fraction of population actually using the social media. Primarily Facebook and Twitter, we just follow people. I mean, if you talk about the original content generated by Twitterati, it's like, you know, maybe less than 1% of people writing about it, but mostly, you know, just following or forwarding. To. Maybe it's a good tool to understand and know about things and we are sharing information as such. But creating content, I doubt that there is so much of social uh, Inclusion happening there. So if I paraphrase your, your question is a paraphrase for the, the team. Um, is there really content out there um, in this all this connectivity? Um, is that a fair gist of your, your question? Can we take one or two other questions and we'll let everybody give a give their pers perspective, sir? In the back. Um, so I, I take the cue from what uh, Mr. Jai just said. I would, and, and this, I think, is, is just, a, um, I, I was kind of waiting for a more uh, proper definition of social media to come up, but somehow didn't. Um, but what, what you just said, I think, really does the, um, it hits the point that social media is eventually about um, the, the, the media broadcaster not producing the content and the social producing the content, so the media content, so media content produced by the social. But there are two other um, criteria of understanding of social media that I would it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit provocative, I guess, but I just want to present nonetheless. So one is, of course, um, that social media is about user-generated content, but it's also hence significantly about how to keep the user-generated content within one media platform. Because the way, say, emails and SMSs work, it was always kind of, it was, they were all meant to be decentralized uh, mediums of uh, communication. So what really uh, social media does is, is it, it centralizes media production and media sharing um, within closed garden media platforms on one hand. So I, I would rather like to differ with, um, with Subhanshu, who said that social media is an exercise in democratization of communication. It does seem that social media is rather an exercise in commercialization of uh, communication. Um, just to add one last thing to that. The other part of social media which uh, didn't come out in the discussion so far, I hope it would eventually. Is social media is, is necessarily and significantly so about, um, about user analytics, about collection of data regarding the users creating the social uh, media content and which actually drives all those um, lovely things about social media that we like such as what your friends are doing, what you should be following, what are the great things you should be buying at Behance and so on. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I think that's a good segue. I would hand this over to Fatima because you mentioned the word analytics and Google and analytics go together. Um, but uh, I think I'll give Aditya a, 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 a turn and then we'll turn it back to the audience to give quick answers to either one of the questions. Is there really content? Is it really democratic in the sense of, or are there walled gardens, uh, which is a comment that was made? Or is it a commercial space for measuring and for metrics? So those three elements of the questions that came out of those comments, I'll turn it to Aditya to give, he'll have the first bite of the apple. Hi, uh, sorry for coming in late. Uh, my flight couldn't find a parking space at the airport, so we were stuck for 30 minutes. It was spiced it, yeah. Uh, so yeah, first thing, um, uh, what the other gentleman said, it's more about uh, content uh, 
which is out there and we are just reading it's more of consumption more than contribution so if there's no content creation there is nothing to consume it's as simple as that and it's more of a it's mo i think it's got to do more with what kind of a person you are uh, even in today's your regular day to day life probably say this setup itself you are probably hearing what people are speaking up here but if you actually end up talking to the people around you that is what you are actually contributing or you are creating content for yourself so it's it's more of an individual perspective that's for me in terms of uh, how do you look at it if you really want to be out there in terms of adding value to the whole ecosystem then you really need to contribute you need to figure out what are the areas you want to contribute and what are your skills and you know stick to those areas if you want to just use it as a news or you know an information channel that is again you know superb like say someone like my dad uses it primarily for consumption i use it for contribution so it it totally depends on the individual there is a whole lot of um, you know there is a whole lot of information out there and at the moment it's super difficult to channelize all of the information that is out there and actually put it to the right use so over a period of time this is going to happen since this is a very new medium uh, i would say right now probably social media is in its beta stage right now uh, and it it's it's going to take a long time for it to evolve turn out into something concrete as far as uh, voicing opinions or being democratic as such through the platform uh, for india i don't think there is a concept of being democratic i don't think we even know what our rules are visa we in real life forget online life you don't know what to do when a cop comes to your house uh, so we have never been taught that since we were a kid it's always been one directional it's always been you know what you have what the superiors tell you is correct so in terms of uh, using this tool for voicing your opinions yes it is happening which is why there's so much controversy which is coming up uh, prior to this medium there was nothing of that sort existing uh you know maybe now now people know that okay i'm going to go back write a blog post and hopefully you know get my issue sorted i think what 3 years back 3 years before there was absolutely uh, you know it, it wasn't even possible to do that or to expect traction to your issue so in terms of the tool being democratic or helping you or helping a particular cause that is going to happen over a period of time but that will take a lot of time because here we are talking about india and uh, you are talking about each each individual who wants the easy way out like if if we actually get down and do the research you will find a lot of information out there which is true which is precise and which actually solves your need but there is a lot of clutter so we always see the clutter we say okay fine you know this is this is going to take one week so let's chuck it and let me try some other medium so that that again boils down you know to your individuality in terms of how do you think you want to utilize the tool if you are using it for the right purposes there are a lot of people who are going to support you but you also need to you know we also need to understand that there is a whole lot of baggage that's going to come along with it it's it's not very simple because as such there is no concept of rights human rights or anything of that sort even if there is we are not aware of it which is a fact so you know that that's a very long shot i would say at at the moment it's and probably you know because of all these elections coming up and how these guys are using the tool it's it's only helping the older generation understand what are the positives and the negatives of this tool which is very 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 important hopefully that will result into something you know concrete over the coming few years thank you um i think probably to keep the conversation going in, do any of the panelists want to comment on those questions or since we only have a few more minutes i'd like to make sure that we are able to include some of our colleagues from other countries as well you've given a perspective sorry aditya get over here um on an indian uh, one answer to the question about uh, democratization on this on the social sphere is there a comment or a question perhaps from our from other south asian uh, participants here in this conference from either uh, from any of the other countries that wants to to give a voice to to their perspective hello i am omer aziz from pakistan so Uh, the perspective i don't uh, know his name the gentleman who just came forward and highlighted uh, two aspects to it about uh, how the commercial enterprise or the uh, new liberal democratic capitalism if you wanted to say that is trying to utilize uh, the social media and statistics uh, to achieve their own uh, ends uh, probably that's what he meant to say when he 
part of these questions. My perspective on that is, being a journalist also from Pakistan, is that uh, change always is uh, probably destructive and creates new roles and brings upon uh, new things and new social orders and new social societies and a lot of things. Uh, so in that particular thing, I personally think that my perspective is that that particular thing, that's like saying that we should stop researchers in the universities because if somebody is researching on South Asia or somebody is teaching business and somebody uh, is doing a lot of research on social orders and studying anthropology and then that is employed by some corporation or some bank or some other business, so that doesn't mean that we should stop that research or anything because social media as a tool is not like, it is not as centralized as they say. I would partly agree with uh, the panelists that it is actually democratizing. It is actually because nobody controls me whatever I express on the Twitter, on Facebook, whatever picture I upload, whatever, for example, even here in this panel, if I take a photograph, I right now upload it on the Facebook, whatever perspective I give is my own. Like, whatever I think about this, whatever, and exactly whatever he thought, he came forward and said it. It is equally true about Twitter, he could upload it and say it out loud to whichever platform he thinks is appropriate and he has got his voice heard. And I personally think that perspective is mine and it is not as if we are all being controlled by these corporations out there through those statistics and analytics which are being used to control us as such. It is not as controlled as that perspective is. That's my perspective. Thank you. I'm going to give the, uh, in this interaction, I'm going to give, uh, uh, go down the line and give Fatima a chance if she wants to comment. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question about, about the walled garden. I think there are uh, various degrees, uh, you know, and you can't, you can't club all of internet together as, in, as a commercial enterprise. So for instance, looking at the differences between an apple that, you know, decides which app it's going to allow and which it's not going to allow to an Android, which is actually trying to grow the ecosystem by allowing, you know, allowing anybody to create an app for, it, uh, for themselves and profit off that if they want. Um, so I think there are lots of differences there. The other thing to keep in mind when you're talking about analytics is that uh, advertisements are what keep the internet free. So if you want a paid internet, then that's a different model that you can actually look at and then you can sort of talk about it being out of the control of corporations because everybody is paying equally and I'm not sure how viable that model would be, but you know, that's something to think about. Uh, on the question of, uh, you know, consuming more and producing less, I think there are, we need to look at the context again. So we are, in India, we are looking at an internet that's uh, primarily in English, whereas we have a population that's, you know, low levels of literacy, uh, non-English speaking, so again, what, what kind of content should we look at creating more? It, it could be more voice-based content. Uh, and those are other things that we need to figure out when we're talking about creating more content locally. But yeah, those are my two. All right, can I take a we have eight minutes, and we have three speakers who, who I'd like to get uh, questions directed to them and what they've made. Can I have some, any uh, other audience question? Uh, the lady in white. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, like Sir said, we are focusing on democratizing and making social media more inclusive. Uh, I think a lot of us have very proudly been saying that in India, more than 75% of the population using the internet and the social media is below 35 years of age. For me, that is somewhat a concern. What about those above the age of 35? What do we do to take out of their mind the cliches of social media? Because every time youngsters like me take to Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter, the question that comes up is, don't visit it too frequently, be careful of fraudulent accounts and fake people. What is it that we individually can do to take this stigma out of the minds of people, especially those above the age of 35, seeing that there's such a thin population using social media? That's a great question, and I'm gonna turn it over to Rama, who's looking at, at uh, the digital Indian. Hello, uh, good morning. I, I'm Vignesh, I teach at IIT Delhi. I have one question for Mr. Roy and one question for uh, Comrade Subransu. Right, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. 
Mr. Roy, uh, okay, I'll start with the question, Mr. Roy. Uh, if you look at social media, there are various functional blocks, right? Uh, say the, the main functional block for building block for YouTube is to share. Of course, sharing is very component. And if you look at Facebook, it's typically getting into conversations. I'm interested in understanding whether the businesses that are using social media are looking at these differences across various social medias that is present. Okay, I see that the entire approach is typically look considering social media as a single concept and bombard all, every, all actions towards it. So I'm interested in understanding any other differences in it, right? This is Mr. Rai. And to Mr. Shubran Shubh, uh, Indian village society has never been equal, right? Water is not accessible to many. So the kind of inequalities you see it in society here, even today, is going to get reflected in social media as well. So it's going to take a long time to change it. Okay, right, this is my observation. And my question here is, uh, this is based on my research I did with undergraduate students, my institute. Right, when I try to understand what kind of usage these uh, kids are having on social media, right, one hand, uh, they like Anna Hazare, they comment a lot, right, uh, they like it, they participate. The, two weeks after that, there is Sunny Leon, right? They like Sunny Leon, right, they comment about it, they share about various things. Okay. Both are digital empowerment. So as a person, I would like to control it, saying that do not see Sunny Leon, get into Anna Asare. That is the case, it becomes anti-democratic, right? You are telling person saying that, don't do this, do this. What's the stand on this? Thank you. Uh, the question here is, social media is, there are various different social medias available. Each of the social media performs one particular function. YouTube looks at sharing, Facebook looks at conversations. How businesses use that? Thank you. To um, the young lady's comment there, um, this is just an anecdotal kind of response, but my mother was um, born and raised in Punjab, and she's on Facebook all of the time. Um, in fact, she's found her college on Facebook and now goes around recruiting people who've been to her college to join the private Facebook group of her Punjabi college. I mean, you know, I think the point is, is that once um, the demographic finds a use in it. You know, she's connecting with her friends now that are scattered all around the world, that may still be in India, that she can't, and she's so happy about it. I mean, um, so I mean, that's one example. And I mean, I guess the other example is if you are going to include voice-based technology and you call it social media, if you are going to um, incorporate community radio and it has a social aspect, all of a sudden now the demographic is growing. So I think when we think under 35, we are still thinking sort of desktop and mobile and tablet generation. But if, if social media is going to become, or is in fact, all of these things, then actually across the space, you've got a social media that is far more inclusive. So I guess that's one of the things for us as broadcasters to make sure that we're communicating, that we're actually showing and expressing the voice of, of all of the people in all of those generations. And if I can come to um, somebody's question about content creation, well, there's a huge, huge amount of content being curated um, and created on the web, and there's hundreds and thousands of blogs. So you, A, you need to know where to go. And secondly, from our experience, if content providers, whether it's broadcasters or other, are always pushing out content, then the community are not interested in giving you anything back. Why should they? You're constantly pushing, 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 and you're not actually listening or not enabling them to create content. So in the, all of our experiences is when we've, over a period of time, have really thought about building communities and really engaged and really listen, then we've got amazing stuff back. Um, and one really quick example is in the UK, there's a, a newspaper called The Guardian, and they've actually got people to scrape the web for them, to do data collection, to do research from them, to investigate for them, to create this amazing collaborative experience. And if that's what you can do, that's really powerful, because at the end of the day, newsrooms are not that big a place. But actually, if you've got the crowd also helping you to create stories and content, now you've got richer stories and content. Um, so. Yeah, that's my two pence. Yeah. So just uh, three quick points. One, uh, this statistic about under 35, uh, you know, being 75% is not significant because of the fact that the majority of India's population is under 35. And what we are finding is that there is actually enormous uh, traction for certain parts of social media, especially Facebook among the elderly. Uh, in fact, number two, I, I, I found so many kids who have really gravitated away and uh, I asked one kid who actually left Facebook why. 
and he said, well, my mom was on it, now my class teacher is on it, this is so uncool. Okay. Um, uh, number three, uh, your question and also the earlier question about, you know, passive consumers. I mean, we, we divide this uh, audience into three. You know, there are passive consumers, there are occasional consumers, and there are active creators of content. Now, this is, again, from the navel-gazing media side, as everything is content generation. Uh, but, you know, depending on the type of social media platform you're looking at, that varies. So on Twitter, for example, you might find one or two percent really active. Another one or two percent or five percent occasionally using it when they need to. Uh, and, but they may be very active on Facebook. And sometimes somebody tells them, now for example, I had a major issue concerning uh, the Gurgaon police, which was to do with the passport verification, and we couldn't make a breakthrough. Somebody mentioned, why don't you just post something on the Gurgaon police Facebook page, and I did that. 24 hours later, the commissioner of police called me, and I was posting as an ordinary citizen, not using my media creds. So it was uh, very, very powerful, because they were actually monitoring that platform more than anything else, you know. I mean, nothing else, were, I, I had sent an email that had not worked. So that is very strong. Number three, uh, the different types, this is a question that you asked uh, me. Uh, I think each of the platforms uh, has its strengths and uh, that's being recognized and leveraged. Now, for example, if you take Google+, uh, it has a very different kind of engagement. You know, you have circles there. Uh, you actually add specific people to circles based on, so for instance, I, I'm part of a photography circle for various people and I've added people to that. And that is very interesting because the discussions are very specific on SLR, digital photography, and where things are going with micro four-thirds cameras and all. It's a very focused discussion. It's not a large, you know, motherhood discussion among a million Twitter users. Uh, Twitter has its own, uh, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff happening there, and we are able to really leverage that for quickly, uh, you know, discussing something, quickly crowdsourcing inputs and things like that. Facebook, again, now Facebook, you will find a much higher percentage of people actually interacting because it's a closed group. It's a closed group and people are posting up stuff. They're posting, their class teachers posting up things about their classes, their parents posting up things. So there is a lot more. So there's a far greater percentage of active consumers, as it were, who are, who are consuming what other stuff people are saying. They're actually pressing likes so that you could classify as in between passive consumption and active generation of content and they are posting stuff. So I think you find these differences and as far as companies go, they're, I think they're uh, using all of them. A Facebook page is very, very uh, classical. You know, I mean, most companies have it. Twitter, most of them are at least passive observ observers and analysts and many of them are actually going out and uh, you know, actively engaging in Twitter uh, first by finding out what people are saying about their company and if somebody's got a problem, the prior service was really bad, whatever, you get in and jump in in advance and try and assuage and say that, okay, we'll do something about it. So there's lots of opportunities which people are actually leveraging across. But yeah, you're absolutely right that the platforms are very, very different. And most of these companies haven't gone to what the youth have actually gone to, you know, the Tumblr, Pinterest, Instagram. That's fairly new territory for companies and governments. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with, uh, though it was not asked to me, uh, from the con content question. See, content is a very political decision. What is a content? What is not a content? Like, I'll give you an example. I went to a village. I was researching why people are not using radio. And they said, Usme to Obama aur Osama ke mein bolte hai. Not this Osama. Uh, so we think, we in BBC think Obama and Osama is great things, great content. But it's of no use to that villagers. It's not content for him or her. They want to hear about what's happening near to them. And then they, they say two things. They speak in a different language and they talk about you know, we, the things we don't understand. So it's a different model. It's a dialogue model. What we have so far, uh, the content words comes from this aristocratic model where a small number of people decide for us, like king and queen used to decide for us. So in dialogue, there will be many things which will be not useful to many people outside our circle. So uh, there should be, so it's democracy. Many people should be talking to each other and as you are saying, so you will be doing crowdsourcing. It will be a bottom-up model. 100 things we discussed, 98 will be useful to only us, as you said. And two will be useful to others. So it will, the things, content will go up rather than you know, sitting at the fifth floor of Hindustan Times building, we decide what's good for the whole nation. That's the model. And that's where I come to the second question 
um, to ask to comrade, um, you know, <laughs> very recently there was a threat, death threat given by Maoist to me on my book. So how much comrade I am, you should think about that. But uh, the same question, it's a democracy. Um, and the answer came from there that, you know, mother is there and teacher is there, so they don't want to do those things. So this, in this model, uh, let people talk and the community will decide what is good. If Sunny Leon is good for the community, let community enjoy that. You know, so like, uh, I am a Hindu, I am a, you know, a, a upper middle class person. My morality is different than a tribal uh, person's morality. So what we are doing in CG Net Swara, the messages are coming. You are absolutely correct that, you know, you can't change everything in one day. So there is Thakurji and Thakur Saab and there is, uh, you know, a tribal. What we are trying to do is moving towards that direction. Like by bringing 50% or 33% reservation for women, there is no equality. Uh, you know, the, another term I hear, SP. I don't know if you go to a village, they say, SP is not superintendent of police, it's Sarpanch Pati, you know, the, the husband of Sarpanch, who is a woman who rules the world. So in the same way, it takes time. So these new tools, uh, which we are calling social media, and I started with, it says not social here. We need to make it more and more social. And, that, and the key is who owns the tool. So if you give an Adivasi an opportunity to speak. You know, they are fantastic in singing and dancing. You ask me to sing, it's very difficult for me. But uh, in this country, and I would like to end with that, you know, this is a platform where we should be talking about this. A majority oral tradition country does not allow radio from 65 years. And anything happens on Facebook, I attend three meetings in a week. You know, anything Kapil Sibyl says, he should be, not be saying that and we should be protesting that. But there is no talk about the real social media. Mobile, internet, radio, if these three can come together, we can really create a dialogue model, we can really create a communication platform which will be bottom up, which will, in, you know, which will make our society stronger, our democracy stronger. I Means I come from Chhattisgarh. We are in the middle of a war. We call it a Maoist war. But actually, it is a break of communication war. If you go, we journalists report hundreds of Maoists attacked. Please go and check how many of them were Maoists. There were two, I call it Raoadi problem. You know, the two Rao's came from Hyderabad. Mao is dead long time back. So these two Rao sahabs, and there are 98 and many sahabs as well, like me. Um, 98 people who are not able to communicate, who are not able to tell our simple problems, which our system can actually solve. And when my problems are not solved, then whoever gives me leadership, we start calling it this problem or that. Tomorrow the Bajrang Dal will give them leadership, we will start calling it a Bajrangi problem. But it was a break of communication problems. So if we want a better future, better democracy, better tomorrow, we should be making social media more social. <clears throat> okay, I think uh, on that, I think he wrapped it up uh, for all of us, uh, that where the social media should go, uh, where it is. Uh, I think uh, just one sentence, uh, social media is great, but it needs to be extremely inclusive. Whenever we are saying that social media is buzzing with whatever words, we must need to understand that it is just 2-3% of those people that we are talking among ourselves in terms of percentage. And that cannot be the voice of the nation or voice of the region or voice of anybody. So that's very, that feeling itself will make all of us more enabling in terms of you know having more and more inclusive. And it needs to be get more oral. And on that note, uh, let's go have a cup of uh, coffee and have the coffee and tea with Subranshu especially, uh, so that you can understand, yeah? Uh, you can understand what the rest of the 90% of the world is all about. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. And we'll see you again at uh, 12 PM in various other rooms. Uh, this is going to be one of the panels. There are three more panels going to go uh, ahead, including the lobby and three more, two more rooms. Thank you very much.